Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to talk about something that's near and dear to almost all of us, and that's really how many friends you've got, as the Vice Chancellor alluded to uh, next door. Um, Darwin, of course, is incredibly prolific. These are probably his three best known books, but he wrote a number of other books during the course of his life, which in sort of intellectual terms are equally good reads. And I recommend them to you, his book on barnacles. And I might remind you that even if none of these books had ever been written, uh, indeed, uh, he'd never done anything on evolution at all, he would still be regarded as one of the founding fathers of geology, um, something that very often sort of uh, people aren't aware of. He was one of the sort of great geologists of the period as well. Anyway, uh, clearly Darwin had a go at almost everything. Uh, quite a remarkable career. But two things really he didn't say a great deal about in the course of this life's work, really, are brains and sort of the emergent properties of social behaviour. You heard from Tristan Wyatt at the beginning that he, he was very interested in sort of, uh, as it were, the, the, the signalling components of behaviour. He wrote this extraordinary book on... Uh, 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 the Evolution of Emotions, uh, which is what really the, one of the foundational books of psychology uh, uh, can be regarded as. But, but he, in terms of the sort of societal aspects of behaviour and the emergent properties of our interactions with each other, as it were, uh, he had very little to say, simply because they didn't know very much about these kind of things. They couldn't do much, a great deal with brains uh, in those days. Um, so one of the things I've been interested in is trying to understand how society or social systems emerge in mammal, uh, uh, mammals in general, primates in particular, and we drifted into humans uh, 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 it, sort of about uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And it was a consequence of an idea which had been proposed in the late 80s by some colleagues of mine up at St Andrews, now known as the, the social brain hypothesis, essentially that one of the reasons primates have such big brains compared to all other species of mammals is that they live in incredibly complex social systems. Um, and it's turned out, in fact, that, that primate societies do seem to differ from the social systems of most other animals, not all, but most other species, in the sense that they're deeply bonded with each other. In some sense, it's been a surprise to us coming from the animal end of the spectrum that, that they, the, the, they are kind of qualitatively different in this sense. But one of the sort of core bits of evidence to support the social brain hypothesis was, was these data here, which we produced now 15 or so years ago, showing that if you take a measure of social complexity like group size from a species and plot it against a measure of brain size, uh, and this is the sort of simple version uh, of the analyses, what you find is that species with big brains uh, tend to live in big, big um, uh, social groups. These are sort of species averages. These are apes here. These are various monkeys, and the monkeys turn out to be a series of grades uh, uh, in which, if you like to think about it, as you move across these grades for the same group size, you're having to use a bigger and bigger computer to manage that social system. Um, uh, with apes sort of lying out here on the right, suggesting that they kind of live in the most complex social world uh, compared to monkeys and apes, but in relatively small groups compared to uh, to some monkey snakes. Now, this is peculiar to primates and perhaps one or two other groups of mammals, but in, it's a very kind of different story in mammals as, as a whole and birds as a whole. So when you look at for this pattern in mammals and birds, generally you don't find it. What you find there is that the species that have the big brains are the ones that live in monogamous mating systems. And there's something about pair-bonded monogamy, particularly lifelong pair-bonded monogamy, the birds show this really nicely, that uh, is deeply complex and deeply challenging, challenging in, a, in a cognitive sense. They need a big brain to do it. And what primates essentially seem to have done is taken the machinery, the psychological machinery to, required to support pair-bonded relationships and generalise those to all members of the group and essentially create friendships. And, and indeed, this, this whole approach of using cross-species uh, analyses, the so-called comparative method, actually goes back to Darwin. It's, it's the methodology he really developed in, uh, in great style in his books and used to very great effect. Okay, so if we plug humans into this, uh, we know where humans lie on this relative brain size uh, component, and, and it's the neocortex, the sort of outer sheet of, 
of our brains that are the, the critical bit because that's what's expanded in primates. Uh, you get a figure, if you read across from the eighth line, a predicted figure of about 150, which is now known thanks to the modern technological age. It's wonderful stuff. Uh, as Dunbar's number, this was a consequence of a big debate on Facebook about the number of friends you can have on Facebook. Uh, and out of that came the labeling of it, uh, much to my amusement. <laughs> it turns out that this group size of 150 appears all over the place. i just give you two examples. Uh, this was our very first attempt to actually look at it in real life. We did it on, on, on Christmas card distribution lists. So this is not the number of uh, cards you send out, but the number of people in the recipient households. And there's a lot of variance in that. Some people are incredibly mean, uh, uh, <laughs> like me, and don't send Christmas cards and apparently have no friends. And then, as, as we heard from the Vice Chancellor, the director of the museum is incredibly social, has a very large number, and sits at this end. But there's a strong peak, and the peak and, and the sort of modal value is very close to about 150. And you can come up with lots and lots of similar examples, and, and, uh, and we have uh, looked at this in considerable detail. What's interesting is you find exactly these numbers in the military. All modern military, uh, particularly the army, is a structure around this value of 150. It's the size of the company. And after that, everything is scaled very nicely. And I'll, I'll come back and show you why in a minute. So this really appears to be the foundational uh, element of both our personal social world, the number of people you know. And I kind of, an informal definition of that is kind of all the people, if you bumped into them in the departure lounge at Hong Kong airport at 3 a.m. or something like that, you wouldn't feel embarrassed about going up to them and saying, hi, how are you? I haven't seen you for ages. You might have some catching up to do, but you know them. Uh, uh, you know where they sit in your social world, and they know where you sit in theirs, as it were. So it seems to be the limit on the number of people we know as persons, that we've got a kind of personal history with. Uh, it turns out uh, that, that the size of the, that, that social circle you have is indeed, as in the original social brain hypothesis, uh, even at the individual level, appears to be related to the size of your brain. And we've shown this now uh, with two separate neuroimaging studies, one of which uh, is a sort of gross analysis looking at the, the, the large-scale areas, and it turns out that this area here in particular, the front, uh, the orbital frontal cortex, uh, correlates with the size of your social network, and in a very detailed voxel-by-voxel-based -voxel -based analysis, uh, again, uh, it's this area up, up in the uh, orbital frontal cortex comes up. So the sort of relative power of computing, in effect, that you can manage up in this area. This area is, turns out to be associated with social reward and, uh, and reward functions in general. And if you, if you blow out those areas, people lose their social skills. They, 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 one of the things they lose is inhibition. Uh, so they uh, act before they think and things like that uh, uh, and say things which are inappropriate or rude. Um, <clears throat> but it, it is sort of heavily, although it's not the only bit that's involved, the sort of, uh, the sort of distributed network of neural uh, components all over the, 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 the cortex that is uh, uh, involved in this, what seems to be particularly important is the control exercised by this area up here. So quite literally, in some sense, people with big brains uh, have big social uh, uh, networks and, uh, and are very intensely social. Um, and what's interesting from the evolutionary point of view, of course, is that the brain has evolved from back to front. So here's the back of the brain here, the occipital end. Uh, the visual system is sort of dealt with up here. The brain has ex expanded during the course of primate evolution in particular and into human evolution, as it were, from back to front. So it's these frontal areas which are particularly well developed in primates, and um, especially so in humans. We have an enormous frontal lobe. Uh, the reality for your social world is that actually it looks a bit like this. It turns out from some very complex analyses that we ended up having to do that your world of 150 is actually composed of a series of layers of relationships, uh, which scale very nicely in a kind of uh, uh, a scaling ratio of five. So each layer is five, uh, sorry, three. Each layer is three times the layer inside it. And indeed, we know uh, from our data that these layers go on for at least two more layers uh, at 500 and 1500. And remarkably, and I think it really is remarkable, Aristotle got that number right. That was the number, he said, you can count the number of friends you have on the fingers of one hand, true friends, let's say. And Plato got the next layer out, which was his 
ideal democracy size, which we might remember as we're about to debate a new voting system here uh, in Britain, um, uh, at 5,300. And, and I give him 300, you know, error margin on that, because they didn't know about statistics, 350 BC, but it's quite extraordinary. But these, what's really quite remarkable about these numbers is they're replicated exactly all the way through, right up to Plato's number and beyond by the military, and the way the military structure uh, their uh, units, as it were, and embed them within these increasing circles of, of hierarchy. The difference here is these have to, up to this point, you have to relate, maintain those relationships by personal knowledge and personally interacting. So if you look through these layers at the frequencies of interaction or at the emotional closeness that people say they have, you'll find it sort of falling off in these step functions as you go around these edges. Um, but beyond that, we need kind of language and rules and discipline and punishment, as it were, to, to, to maintain the structures behind that. That's the, or beyond that, that's the kind of natural limit. We're able to build bigger and bigger units by having these kind of um, social rules, as it were, that, that, that allow us in, in much more simplified form to maintain bigger structures. But those people outside that 150, we don't have personalized relationships with. We know each of these as individuals. Uh, it turns out uh, that what's critical, really, is maintaining uh, those relationships by face-to-face -face interaction. It really is personalized knowledge that you have. Uh, and we think from the work we've done now that although things like electronic media are quite good at allowing you to keep a relationship ticking over, in the end, if you don't get together and bang your heads together, that relationship will actually decay. Uh, and despite all the claims, and in some sense this is sort of uh, where a lot of this uh, got started, despite all the claims, you don't get more friends on Facebook than you have in the real world. Um, around February, Facebook did a complete analysis of all 44 million uh, Facebook pages, prompted by uh, uh, our, our work, to see how many friends people actually had, because obviously some people are claiming 500, 1,000, even 5,000. It turns out that the average is uh, between 120 and 130, so very close to real life. Now, one of the interesting uh, sort of observations we notice, as it were, is that it tends to be girls that have the 120 to 130, so they're keeping their uh, sort of Facebook pages pretty close to their real life things. It's the boys that have the 500s and the thousands. So just going back to Tristram's talk at the beginning, what we think that probably has to do with is mate advertising. <laughs> How popular you are. <laughs> Being popular with other girls turns out to be a very good uh, cue that women use in humans for uh, mate quality, in addition to the smell. <laughs> <laughs> it also turns out uh, and part, one of the things we were interested in is, is how relationships decline and drop down over these layers. So we just finished last year a long-term 18-month study looking at uh, what happened over long periods of time when people moved away. And because it was tied in with technology, and a lot of this stuff has got tied up with the mobile phone industry now. We've become really very interested in it indeed. Like we're involved in four different projects with various uh, computer scientists and mobile phone providers. Uh, how technology helps slow down the rate of uh, decline on relationships. Slightly to our surprise, what came out of this was actually is a huge gender effect. Uh, so what we've got here, this, in this study we asked people two things at repeated intervals, and this is sort of over 18 months. How often uh, uh, did you do stuff with the people in your network? Um, uh, go shopping, go to parties, help them move house or what have you, and how often did you contact them and have a chat with them, either on a phone or, or face to face. And it turns out that, as one might expect, uh, if you do less stuff, if, you, if, you, if over 18 months you, you spend less time banging heads together with them or talk to them less often, the quality of the relationship declines over time. So this is a measure of the change in emotional quality of the relationship between month zero and month 18. Uh, if you keep the rate of uh, both con uh, doing stuff and talking to them the same, it, naturally the relationship stays the same. And if you increase the amount of activity 
or, or the amount of uh, 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 talking to them, the relationship increases, but it's gender specific. Right? For boys, relationships are maintained by doing stuff together. For girls, by talking. Very, very striking effect, which explains very nicely to you why boys' phone calls are only 7.3 seconds long on average. <laughs> I'll see you down the pub at 7 o'clock. And girls spend massive amounts of time on the phone. So <laughs> phone technology, and particularly mobile phone technology, is perfectly designed to support the female social world. This goes back to this, my little caricature of what relationships are really like. For girls, they're very personal, very one-to-one, -one, very intense. So the sort of typical thing would be what life was like when you were about eight or ten. So when Penelope didn't invite you to her party, this was the ultimate crisis of the universe. <laughs> now for boys, the relationship is standing on opposite sides of the road, kicking a football backwards and forwards, and that's a relationship. Now actually, I, I, I have a view that it doesn't really matter whether it's a little boy on the other side of the road or the wall. <laughs> as long as the football comes back, <laughs> it's fine. And that, that may help explain a great deal to you <laughs> about your experience of life. Thank you very much. <laughs>